Welcome to Friends and Fiction, four New York Times bestselling authors, endless stories. Novelists Mary Kay Andrews, Kristen Harmel, Christy Woodson Harvey, and Patty Callahan Henry are four longtime friends with more than 70 published books between them. Together, they host Friends and Fiction with author interviews and fascinating insider talk about publishing and writing to highlight and support independent bookstores. They discuss the books they've written, the books they're reading now, and the art of storytelling. If you love books and you're curious about the writing world, you're in the right place. Hello, hello. Hello. It is Wednesday night, and that means it's time for my favorite hour of the week. Welcome to Friends in Fiction. We have so much to look forward to tonight. I'm Kristen Harmel. I'm Christy Woodson Harvey. I'm Patty Callahan Henry. And I'm Mary Kay Andrews. And this is Friends in Fiction four New York Times bestselling authors, endless stories to support indie bookstores. Tonight, we'll meet Tasha Alexander and Andrew Grant, two acclaimed New York Times bestselling novelists who also happen to be married to each other. This is the second husband and wife team we've hosted after John Truby and Leslie Lair last month, and I'm so excited to dive in with them. We'll talk about each of their new books, as well as what it's like to be married to another successful writer, how they influence each other's work, what it's like to live in a log cabin in Wyoming, and what's up next for each of them. And we have partnered with Warwick's in beautiful La Jolla, California, as our featured independent bookstore for the month of October. Works is the country's oldest continuously family-owned and operated bookstore, so we see them as an ideal partner for our mission here on FNF. Friends in fiction, by the way. We're going to keep <laughs> encouraging you to shop local and shop small by buying from Works over the course of the next few episodes of Friends in Fiction. And we will also ask you to look at the special opportunities along the way and browse their selection, which also includes our books, as well as the latest by tonight's guests, Tasha Alexander and Andrew Grant. And we have a kind of cool announcement (laughs) to make tonight. I'm going to say it's more than kind of cool. I'm going to say it's super cool. You (laughs) already know that you can watch us live each week on Facebook and YouTube. And that if you want to see any of our previous episodes, 90 of them, we're coming up on our (laughs) hundred. They're all cataloged on our YouTube channel. Well, starting this Friday, you can also catch us on a brand spanking shiny (laughs) fancy new platform (laughs) and when we say brand new we mean like right now it is called loco plus it specializes in locally produced content and it launches this friday right now today at this moment while you're (laughs) listening you can sign up to watch online and in the next few weeks there will be an app available on ios and android Android and Andrew, Andrew, that's our guest. <laughs> Android too. It's a, it's a great place, not only to find our best of episodes and new episodes each week, but also to find other cool content, such as a brand new good news show from our September guest, former CNN anchor Darren Kagan. It will eventually cost a few dollars a month to access the service, but if you sign up this week, the first 60 days, starting when it launches this Friday with us. <laughs> you are absolutely free to try it out. Sean is going to put up the link below and we really encourage you to sign up right now. It helps support local businesses and is founded by some really smart women. And we're so happy to be a part of their launch. And we hope you'll join us to see what else you can discover on their streaming service. So sign up at Go Loco Plus, and we will see you there.
Yeah, we're so excited about that. Thanks for telling us about it, Patty. Speaking of cool new things you'll definitely want to be involved in, tonight is a night where you will want to stay until the very end of the show because we will be showing you at the bottom of the hour the cover mm -hmm. reveal of The Homewreckers, Mary Kay's brand new novel, which will be out on May 3rd, 2022. You guys are not going to want to miss this. The cover is amazing, and we cannot wait to hear Mary Kay tell us about the book going to be so fun. It is. Yeah. And you know, every week we partner with Parade Magazine online. This week, Kristen reflected on something that just blows my mind. <laughs> I know. This is so something that I never in a million years would have had the courage to do. But she <laughs> talks about her decision to move to Paris on a whim in her early 20s the most impulsive thing she's ever done, which is good because moving to a foreign country with a stranger on a whim is, is pretty impulsive. <laughs> <laughs> you can find it linked on our Facebook page and in our Instagram bio. But meanwhile, Kristen, can you tell us about it? Yeah, just very briefly. And actually, I was thinking what a perfect um, discussion topic this is tonight because I think Tasha um, has also... You know, it, it, Tasha and Andrew, who are our guests tonight, I think have done some really extraordinary things, such as leaping into this home in Wyoming, which I think was a big life change for them. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But yeah, when I was in my early 20s, you can read the essay. I don't have to recap it for you. But um, I, basically, I moved to Paris on a complete whim. I didn't speak French. I had no idea what I was leaping into. Uh, but I think, Sean, I think you have the picture of what the view from my window Amazing. actually was. I mean, I didn't know if I was walking into like a murder house that, you know, I was never going to come. Back from, but it turned out to be this. That was my view, and it changed my life and changed my um, my career. And and I, I think sometimes I forget about the value of being impulsive. Sometimes not always having to know the next step. Um, and as I put it in the essay, leaping before you look every once in a while. So I'm wondering, from the three of you, has there ever been a time that you've done something a little bit impulsive, a little bit out of character, that turned out to be exactly the leap you needed? Well, some of my impulsive things I don't want to talk about, but <laughs> but there was a time when when my youngest son graduated from college and it was the first time I was going to be alone in the house. I mean, with my husband, but in 20 something years. And so I applied thinking there's no way I'll get it for this trip. It was a hiking trip to Ireland and you had to write an essay and you had to be accepted and hundreds of people applied. And I thought there's no way I'm going to get it, but I'm just going to do it. And I was accepted. And when I got it, I thought I'm not going, I can't go by myself to Ireland. And then I did. And it was one of the best things I have ever done. It's life changing. It is. It is. How about you, Mary Kay? You know, I had, I was struggling to find, think about, when when was the last time I've done something just totally impulsive? Um, I'm not normally a reckless person, so I haven't. I don't know if I've done anything reckless. I was thinking about when have I done anything like that? Maybe um, when I um, adopted my pseudonym when I was working on Savannah Blues. Yeah. We were getting ready to remodel our house in in Atlanta, and I announced to my husband and family because we weren't going to have a kitchen. I said, okay, y'all, I'm moving to Savannah for the summer to work on the book that would become Savannah Blues. And so I said, peace out, y'all. <laughs> I rented a friend's basement apartment. And um, it's the first time I'd ever lived alone in my life. Wow. I'd, I'd always shared a bedroom with my sister. Then I went to college and then my room next roommate was my starter husband. <laughs> and, um, I'd never lived alone. So I guess that's yeah. I guess that's as impulsive as I get. I, I might have to loosen up. Kristen, you <laughs> keep hanging out with us. We'll yeah, get you there. Exactly. That's right. We'll get you there. <laughs> I think I'm kind of I don't know if impulsive is the right word, maybe just like decisive. And yeah. I will make these like big decisions kind of that I think to other people, it doesn't look like I've thought them through, but I'm just like, no, I know, I know that's the, yeah, that's the yeah. thing. Now, nothing huge like moving to Paris or anything, but so there are like a lot of things that I could say or think about, but honestly, y'all, I think the show, I mean, yes. we all made a very impulsive decision yeah. to jump into this thing that like, 
took over in a way that our lives it did. It did. yeah and we all just like every day we get up and we keep saying yes you know and i think that's really the thing that i think about especially like during this past you know couple of years where there hasn't been a lot of opportunity to be like let's you know hop on a cruise to blah. you know you can't <laughs> you're like, you're like so impulsive in a pandemic so i mean I, I think that's a good one. I really do. And it's like, and it just yeah. goes to show like what Kristen wrote about that sometimes those big leaps end up being the best things that ever happened to us. Ah, oh, that's so true. You're right. This has been so wonderful. And you're right. It, it's, and it was a leap at the beginning and it continues to be a leap, right? Yeah. I mean, this is like, just... the plus. We're like new yeah. service. Can we do it? Exactly. Tasha well, and Andrew, let's go for it. Let's yeah, try exactly. it. Exactly. 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 So to all of you out there, we would love to hear your stories too. If you have an example of a time you have leapt without looking and really felt like it was the right choice. Choice. Put it in the comments or, you know, tell us about it um, under announcements on our Facebook page. We always love to hear from you. It means so much to us. So now, without further ado, let's talk about our incredible guests, Tasha Alexander and Andrew Grant. Tasha is the daughter of two philosophy professors. Wow. She is the author of the long-running Lady Emily series, as well as the novel Elizabeth, the Golden Age which is the novelization of the 2007 Universal Pictures film starring Kate Blanchett. Did I say that right? Blanchett. Yeah. Tasha studied English literature. Yeah, that's how you say it, right? Tasha studied English literature and medieval history at the University of Notre Dame, and now she lives in South, I think it's actually Notre Dame, and now she lives in Southeastern Wyoming with her husband, who happens to be today's other guest novelist Andrew Grant. Andrew Grant hails from Birmingham, England, and after studying English literature and drama at the drama at the <laughs> University of Chef. I mean, it's hard to say drama. Sometimes you want to say drama, but don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> or Notre Dame instead of Notre Dame. Oh, well, but it's they both are correct. They're just different. Yes, yes, true. <laughs> yes true. Yes. So drama. He founded and ran, he, he also, <laughs> at the University of Sheffield, he founded and ran a small independent theater company, which, among other things, appeared at the world-famous Edinburgh Fringe Festival. He then worked in telecommunications for 15 years be finally, before finally making the transition to becoming a novelist. In addition to being married to Tasha Alexander, he is the younger brother of novelist James Grant, whom the world knows as Lee Child. In January 2020, Child announced that he intended to retire from his enormously popular Jack Reacher book series and that Andrew would take over. So he is now writing that series under the pen name Andrew Child. How cool, right? How exciting is that? So and, and cool. Mary Kay, you, you can have some uh, stuff to talk about about pseudonyms. That's awesome. Great. Yeah. So we have so much to talk about tonight with both of these fascinating guests. Sean, can you bring Tasha and Andrew on? Hi, guys. But I just want to, I just want to stop everything. And Mary Kate, tell us everything about home records. Because I'm obsessed already. <laughs> I can't. I, uh, no, we're talking about your books. That's the point of this evening. Your, your books. We want to hear and your life. Exactly. Yeah. So Tasha and Andrew, we're so excited to have you. We're so happy you're here. Tasha, could you begin by telling us about The Dark Heart of Florence, which I believe is the 15th novel in your Lady Emily series, which will be out in paperback this coming Tuesday? Amazing. Yeah, I can't I can't believe it's already coming out in paperback. This this book, it's it's funny because when I I went to Florence research the book in November of 2019. Oh, man. I actually got really sick while I was there, and I'm pretty sure I was like patient zero in Tuscany with COVID. Oh, my gosh. Sorry, Sorry Tuscany. Um, <laughs> if it wasn't you, it was going to be someone. So whatever. Right, so right. Whatever. Um, it, it, it all goes back to this woman I was sitting next to on a plane about seven days beforehand. But that that's another long, boring story. Um, but then this book... I I got really interested while I was doing the research on this. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with it. And I think anybody who writes a long running series gets this. You, you want to bring something fresh to the characters. And when I was 
doing when I was kind of delving into the research, I usually start by looking at a place and then looking at historically what was happening there at the time. Um, and I had decided I had settled on Florence. But what really captivated me, my protagonist, Emily, her husband, Colin, who's indescribably handsome and a dashing covert agent of the crown who's basically single-handedly keeping the British Empire going. Uh, the book that Emily's part of the book is set in 1903. And at that time in Britain, you know, we're getting into things that are leading to the First World War. And what I learned was that the British public fueled or catalyzed by the tabloid press, does this sound familiar? Um, <laughs> yeah. Was, was really being spoon fed this idea that Germany was horrible and evil and that they were trying to invade Britain, which of course was really not the case wow. yet. Um, but there was a whole uh, movement in, in writing where people were writing these books that were about German spies in Britain it, around the turn of the century. And funnily enough, and not surprisingly, once you get post-World War I, we learn that there were literally no spies, German spies in Britain before the war. But it, it just really kind of shows you how people believed this. They believed it. It was not true. Again, does this sound familiar? Um, so I was really taken with this idea of, of a group of a sensibly intelligent, connected, engaged people going down this rabbit hole of believing that their country was full of German spies. And so that was kind of what set me off on the, the path for this book. Um, and then there is a second storyline, because we always have Emily, and this is 1903, but um, if you're going to write about Florence, you really do want to write about the Renaissance. And so the secondary yeah. timeline in the book follows the story of a young woman who is living during in Florence during the Renaissance, um, going through the time when Savonarola, really this just mad and insane monk, um, stirs up the population to start destroying the, the art and the literature and the beautiful things that that made the Renaissance the Renaissance. Yeah. So see, I'm not really good at explaining a book. I kind of have that to write great. the book. And <laughs> No, you explained it perfect. Yeah, and I, I'm the same way. I feel like I, I but I, I thought that was great. That was fantastic. And I'm excited to talk to you in a minute just about the idea for that whole series, because I think it's so, um, such an interesting idea and so different from what other people are doing. I love it. But uh, before we get to that, Andrew, can you tell us a little bit about Better Off Dead, the 26th installment of the Jack Reacher series, which I believe will be out October 26th? Absolutely, yeah. That's that's the launch date, and we're you know we're very excited about it because we just had such a fun time writing it. You know, the the last two, my brother and I wrote together, and um, we um, you know when, when he he made the decision to 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 sort of bring me on board, it's a kind of gradual retirement for him. Um, he had a couple of things that he wanted to try to do, you know, a couple of sort of slight course corrections he wanted to make. So with the first book, last year's book, The Sentinel, we had those in mind. You know, we, we, we had a couple of things that we wanted to achieve, which is very unusual for him because, you know, he's famous for never outlining, never planning, just coming up with a good opening sentence, really, not even an opening scene, and then just taking it from there and seeing where it goes. So the Sentinel, we had a couple of things we wanted to do, and we felt like we, we achieved those things. So this time around, we, we didn't have that, you know, hanging over us. We could just come up with a fun beginning and, and run from there. And so um, what I did was I kind of secretly wrote this introduction, this this first chapter, and, and sent it to him to see what he what he thought about it. And I came up with this idea of a scene that was right on the border between Arizona and Mexico, where um, a huge, a huge guy was waiting for a kind of clandestine meeting. And uh, it's supposed to be with one person, but actually four people showed up. And these four people came, you know, had the misguided idea that they could uh, they could get the better of the enormous stranger and turned out not so well for them. Um, but then another person arrived out of the shadows, shot the stranger in the chest, 
and the next scene is the morgue in the in the little town where um, this giant figure is on the slab <clears throat> and they examine his his possessions and he doesn't have very many all he has is a uh, he's got an ATM card he's got an expired passport he's got a few dollars and he's got a folding toothbrush and when they open the passport to the to the information page it gives the name Jack non reacher so uh, you know it starts out with with Jack on the slab and if you want to know how we got there and uh, what happens next uh, I'm afraid you're gonna have to buy the book wow. what a great teaser <laughs> okay that's the ultimate tease right there. yeah yeah that's the ultimate He's good. Yeah, that. <laughs> that's the ultimate hashtag buy my book, damn it. <laughs> okay, Andrew, uh, you know, it's fascinating and rare to take over a series from a living author the way you've done here. And I can't imagine picking up the mantle from a sibling, especially considering that I read a quote from you saying that when you started out writing, I spent all my time trying not to sound like Lee Child. Um, I love that idea. I can only imagine. I, I, have, a young, I have a younger sister who, who uh, is a playwright, and I can't imagine her ever, ever wanting to do anything that I want, that I've done. Yeah. But I love the idea that sometimes we don't know where the road will lead. And I wish you would tell us about how your brother approached you to take, first of all, do you call him Lee? Do you call him by his real name? How does that work? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've got, it, it varies, honestly. You know, I normally try and avoid his name altogether and just say <laughs> my brother. Are you just call but, him Apple? Um, yeah. <laughs> Just like that, that old geezer that no one needs to really worry about anymore, you know? Um, <laughs> no, but you know what? I think his, I, I actually met Lee the very first time I was doing a book event before my first book came out. And so he was always Lee to me. And then once we got together, I needed to call him Jim. And that was really hard for yeah, a very weird. long time. Yeah. 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 But I mean, what, what happened honestly was um, we, it, uh, in the graphic that, sh that flashed up earlier, you had the, the last book that I wrote on my own, the, um, the, the second in my Paul McGrath series, which is called uh, Too Close to Home. And that book came out, in, there it is, that book came out in uh, January 19. So um, because we live, you know, after we moved to Wyoming, um, you know, my brother thought we were crazy, he couldn't understand what we were thinking moving from Chicago to here. So he came out to have a look. And after he'd been here about half an hour, he said, hey, are there any other houses for sale around here? <laughs> oh my gosh. But he actually bought the one. He, he's now next door, but one neighbor. So in Wyoming, that means he lives three and a half miles away. <laughs> so, um, so when Too Close to Home came out, because we're in, in southern Wyoming, um, they wanted to do the launch event at a bookstore in Denver in Colorado um, called The Tattered Cover. So I, I called him up and said, you know, do you want to come to this event with me? And he said, yeah, sure. And so we figured it made more sense just to go in one car. And he wanted to go in his car so that he could smoke. So um, he drove us down there. And you know what it's like when you're getting ready to do an event. All you're really thinking about is the event. You're thinking, I hope I don't say anything ridiculous. I hope I don't forget my own name. I hope I don't trip over my feet on the way to the stage. You hope that someone comes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's so, the biggest uh, for me. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, was, I was totally focused on the event. Fortunately, it, it went pretty well. But then on the way back, he said to me, all right, well, I drive down, you drive back. And it's only later when I see how carefully he planned this whole thing because it's, it's January and we're in northern Colorado crossing into southern Wyoming. So the weather is horrendous. We've got this ground blizzard going on where there's this yeah. snow and ice blowing horizontally in front of the car. We cannot see a thing. I oh. said to him when we when we left, I said, you know, it's 50-50 whether we wind up at home or whether see, we wind up in a ditch. A wise person <laughs> would have just got a hotel. <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> the grandmothers do not get a hotel. No, we, they will soldier on. We set off to drive home, so we were driving home. There was no, there was no debate. So we dri I'm driving along, and I'm having to focus really hard on not crashing the car. And just sort of very casually, my brother says to me, you know, I'm thinking of retiring. 
And so if I was a nice person, I would have said to him, yes, absolutely, you should retire. You've worked so hard for all of these years. You've brought all of this pleasure to all of the readers who love your books. You know, you should just take some time, enjoy the fruits of your labor and have a lovely retirement. But I'm not a nice person. So instead I said to him, what do you mean retire? What's going to happen to Reacher? Because... You know, the thing is, I'm the oldest Reacher fan in the world. Oh, I was the, no. first, I'm the first person to have ever read a, a Reacher book. Uh, you know, because, ne you know, the boot 25 years ago was on the other foot. I had a really good job in the telecoms industry, and he was out of work and broke. And, you know, he decided that the way he was going to to fix this problem of having no money was to write books, because we all know that's a good idea, yes. right? Yeah, right. Fast track to massive wealth, 100% of the time. Yeah. <laughs> what do you do with all those yachts? <laughs> so, money, 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 money. Problem. <laughs> yeah. So he writes, he writes the first Reacher book, Killing Floor, and it's on yellow paper written in pencil. And he sends it to me to read because he knows that I'm, the, you know, really the only thriller reader in the family. And I remember, oh, like, looking at the opening the envelope, looking at the first page because I'm terrified for two reasons. Because I'm thinking, what if the book is terrible? Yeah. I'm going to have to call my big brother and say, "Listen, I'm sorry, but your book sucks." Who wants to do that? I didn't want to do that. But then it came with a practical consideration too, because if it had sucked. He had no job. So what was going to happen? Was I going to have to send him food parcels? You know, was yeah. I going to have to let him live in the bedroom? You know, what was going to happen? So um, <laughs> luckily, luckily the book was fabulous, and I, I didn't have to say those things. And, you know, the rest was history. But I've been a Reacher fan for more than a quarter of a century. Um, every, you know, and, and Reacher had almost become like a kind of extra imaginary brother. You know, when we hung out together, we would always say, oh, what would Reacher do about this? What would Reacher do about that? What would he, you know, if something would come on the news or we'd see something happening at a baseball game or a, a soccer game and we'd say, well, what would Reacher do about that? So it's, it's this entity that's kind of existed between us for all of these years. And I just couldn't stand the idea that there wouldn't be any more Reacher books. And I certainly couldn't stand the idea that it would be my fault that there were no more Reacher books. So really, that was that was what what tipped the balance for me. The other thing was I can't quite remember how he phrased it, but it was almost like a kind of challenge involved in what he said. You know, maybe maybe you'd like to to join me, or maybe you'd like to start writing something like that. And whatever it was, it struck me as a bit of a challenge. And I've, I'm terrible. If if anything is like a challenge. Um, I've got myself yeah. into so much trouble mm -hmm. over the years. You know, you guys were talking about things that you did that were impulsive or whatever. For me, the things that have been the, the that have caused me the most grief have always been the things that have sounded like a challenge that I couldn't walk oh, away from. So it, it, it's almost like he knew you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I when I was little, my dad would. If there was something he thought I couldn't, that was a bit of a challenge, he would always say, "Oh no, Andrew will never be able to do that," and that <laughs> meant, you know. I, I would do it twice and take photographs. And it was only when I was older that I realized he knew all along what, what, uh, what he was doing. So, that's yeah, awesome. so that's, that's came about. It was all in, the, in his car driving, driving back from that, that book event. And, um, you know, wow. it was a while ago now. And so um, we've got two under our belt. Well, one, one is out in the world. Uh, better off to come. And we're already working on the, on the next one because he had this thing where he you know he like i said he was on the he was he was out of work when he started writing he got fired from his job on um august 31st so he started writing killing floor on september the 1st so he has this long running almost superstition you know this tradition that he has to start the next book on september 1st so september 1st wow. this year we, we started interesting that's so, cool andrew what is it like taking over an established series like this. And I, I keep thinking about the reaction to fans after, you know, in the movies, they cast Tom Cruise yeah. as Reacher <laughs> in the movie. I mean, my husband is a major, major uh, Reacher fan. And he's like, how, uh, how, I mean, they cast a hood ornament. As Reacher, how did that <laughs> an ornament? <laughs> the male version okay, of the Polly Pocket doll. I have to 
defend Tom Cruise. Okay. So first of all, Tom Cruise is one of the first pe actors that we all know to be short, right? Yes. Um, and I think that maybe has something to do with the jumping up and down on Oprah's couch. Um, <laughs> yes. For Katie Home. Yes. Yeah. But most, but most, most leading men are really short. In fact, Jim yeah. Lee went to when they were filming the first movie. He went to Paramount and was on the set and you know at the studio and the the costume mistress, like the head of costumes at Paramount Pictures, brought him in to her department and gave him a jacket and he and she said, "Put this on." So you know. Jim's really tall, not quite as tall as Andrew, but he's really tall. Yeah. Um, and so he puts on and, and the jacket comes up to like about here on him. Huh? Oh no. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. oh no, that Claire! Claire! Suspense. what happened with Claire, the jacket? What the next? They planned what? it. Okay, I'm gonna guess. So I what, the, what the lady said was that jackets are that size because that's what most leading men are. Oh no, we lost them. Oh my gosh, I hope they come back. Well, how how interesting was that story though about yeah. how he took over the series? I think that's amazing. Could you imagine doing that with a sibling? Like if 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 Jeannie came to me and said, I, you know, let's write it together, I'd be like, what? That would be crazy. And Sean is pointing out in the comments we should address. So they're having a little bit of internet trouble. Um the um they have satellite internet and uh, and they've had a snowstorm, I think they said today. So um, their internet's a little bit off right now. So hopefully they'll be able to reconnect. That's why they're a little bit fuzzy. We're, we're kind of trying to make the best of it. So just letting you guys all know. Um, Should we do the cover of you? <gasps> we could do that. Do you want to do that? Can, let's no? do this. Can we like go completely off script? I mean, I yeah. Mean, let's let's go rogue. Tonight is about being impulsive. Yeah, oh, let's, let leap, let's leap before we look, Kathy. This is your first lesson. This is your first lesson in doing it. <laughs> Mary Kay, like, can we? you can we wish that you could be more impulsive. And <laughs> so, we are yep. here to grant your wish. <laughs> We're here to just push you to the edge of your comfort zone all of the days. Right. Christy <laughs> is manifesting intentions over there. Right. right and left and soon, <laughs> soon we will have something amazing to tell you about the in our intentions that she has somehow manifested right but bring, bring it on, it on in in pay. Pay. give the people yep. what they want okay <laughs> okay so now for the moment we've been waiting for yes. <laughs> This is me doing sound effects. Patty, you're not by the way. No, no, I know, I know, <laughs> but I'm being impulsive. Not okay, when right. you're jet lag. Not when you're jet lag. <laughs> okay, I know, I know. Why you're so jet lagged, by the way? I don't. Oh, so before we do this moment, we've been waiting for. I. Oh, oh they're back. They're back. They're back. They're back. This is what happens, because let me just say, I'm like checking on my phone, I'm like, the internet's working. This is what happens when you try to reveal that Clint Eastwood is also short. Mm -hmm. okay. he, was, he was listening. It breaks the movie star. star. It breaks the internet. Yeah. Because, so, so Jim pulls on this jacket, it comes like, to his elbow or whatever, and she says, that is the jacket, one of the jackets that Clint Eastwood wore in the Dirty Harry movies. And oh, she wow. said, look, here's the thing with leading men. We are all within about four inches of each other. So this idea wow. that Tom Cruise is a dwarf, well, you know, yeah. also, and, and I mean, Lee said this from the beginning working with him, Tom read all of the books. Tom took awesome. this very, very seriously. Tom yep. worked so hard. He showed up prepared. You know, I mean, we all have our... Issues yeah. with Tom Cruise, I guess. Like, why do we have so many issues with Tom Cruise? Like, I'm not really entirely because you it know, makes I was it on easy tour. to have issues I, with him. No, I guess you know what? Was, I was on I was on tour at the time that the announcement came, and I couldn't talk about anything at my uh, my events for my book except how short Tom Cruise was. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> like, this is what we got going on. Mm -hmm. no. so this is what we're doing now. I, 
I, how I like Andrew. Andrew's a nice how guy. Is He's Andrew, a nice how is it, Andrew, um, you know, taking over kind of a iconic, I mean, were you at all intimidated by the expectations or did you just say, bring it on? Well, you know, your, your original question was spot on because the first thing that came to my mind was the reaction with the Tom Cruise stuff for the movies, right. you know. I just thought, you know, the Reacher fans are so loyal and so passionate. You know, they have these these kind of pretty violent reactions. And I thought, you know, I don't want to be on the wrong side of that. Yeah. But I also thought, I mean, you know what it's like writing a book? You've always got those voices in the back of your head you know you're imagining your editor saying oh my god this is the stupidest thing i've ever read you know you're imagining you know, what yes. the reviews you're going to get on amazon you're imagining you know all of that stuff and the only uh, thing you can the only uh, thing you can do is cut out right that's all you yeah, can do yeah. all you can do is yeah. ignore it so yeah. i tried to take this approach where i gave myself a certain period of time where i would acknowledge the fact that yet yeah, i was taking a risk and there could be an adverse reaction and then i thought okay time you know time out on that that goes in a box and it goes on the shelf and i'm not going to think about it anymore mm -hmm. all i'm going to do is do the best job that i can and just hope that it's it's, it's good enough because you, you know when there's pressure like that what can you do about it? It's out of your control. You've just got to ignore it and, and, and try and do your job. And that's what I did. And I mean, yeah, there, there, there were, you know, I think probably the nicest thing that, uh, that, that came out of it was that, the, you know, we, we, we'd known for a little while about what we were planning to do before it became public. And the publishers wanted to control the narrative and wanted to kind of handle the, the way that the news was, was released. But before they could do that, somebody a journalist somewhere found out somehow and he leaked the story and it wound up in the in the press first of all in london and then it came over to the states and so it was out there there's nothing anybody could do to manage it or curate it or spin it you know it was just the news it was this is what's happening and what i really loved about that was that the majority of the responses were just so kind to my brother you know they were we, right. we love his book but he's, we've loved reading them for all these years. We wish he would keep going, but hey, you know, everybody needs to retire eventually. And they were wishing him the best. And I just loved that. It was, it was genuine. They, I think people could tell that the story was, was just the story. It hadn't been, you know, doctored or, or tarted up in any way by, by any PR people. It was just, it was just the unvarnished truth. And so once they, you know, they had that lovely response as far as my brother was concerned. And then, you know, there were a few kind of voices saying, oh, well, what's going to happen? Is it, is it going to be any good? Is it going to be, is Andrew going to ruin it? And then luckily the majority of, of voices that came back were saying, well, we don't know, but give the guy a chance, you know, wait until, wait until he's written one and see what you think. Yeah. And yeah. so, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful for the way that that happened because of course people were going to be worried. It's natural as a change. People are worried. Is it still going to be the same? Is it going to be as good? And um, when I met the, I had to meet the publishers in London and they were asking me, what was my, what was my goal? And what I said was, you know, because Lee, right from the very beginning, he always said it wasn't about him. It was about Reacher. He always wanted right. people to, if they were going to go to the bookstore, he wanted them to go and say, have you got the new Reacher? You know, not the mm. specific title necessarily, Definitely. not him, Reacher. So I said, well, my goal would be um, somebody, you know, new, the next Reacher comes out. Somebody is rushing to the bookstore to buy it on their way home from work, but they get delayed. You know, there's, there's traffic problems, whatever. By the time they reach the bookstore, there's only one copy left, and that copy has been damaged. Somehow the cover has been torn off. The spine is missing. The only thing that's left are the pages that contain the story. So they buy it anyway because they can't wait to read it, and they go home, and they stay up all night reading the book, and they get to the end and they say, wow, 27, 28, 29 books in, and it's just as good as ever. You know, what I want is for them to not even notice yeah. the difference. It's yeah. just, you know, our, our father was Irish, so he could get away with these things. And he had this expression, the same, only different, you know, oh, and that's it. what I want. 
yeah, I want it. I want people to read it and think, wow, yeah, just the same as ever, just as good as ever. I don't want anybody to think, oh well, you know, this has changed or that's changed yeah. or you know, I don't want them. I don't want to put my my stamp on it. I don't want to put my my you know my mark on it. I just want it to be what my brother created, and I I, I keep going for for as long as people want us to keep going. But I so think Reacher is one of those really rare characters that has become so iconic. And I, I think I can share this story that Lee told us about a, a woman uh, who works in his agent's office, who was, and his agent is in Britain. And so this woman is in line for coffee behind a quite elderly woman who is holding the new Lee Child book. And she says to the woman, you know, I actually, I, I, I work in his agent's office. And the woman turns her ex office. Oh, <laughs> oh, I love it. And she said, oh, no, 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 Lee Child, the, the author. And she's like, well, but the author's Jack. Oh, oh wow. And yeah. Said, well, no, you know, so the books are about Jack Reacher, but but Lee Child writes them. And so the woman said, she kind of paused for a minute and then she said, oh, you mean you mean Jack sits down with this Lee Child fellow and tells him the story and he writes it down. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I, I guess the, the idea is, uh, Andrew, a seamless transition. Mm-hmm. And it, I mean, this this iconic character. That's what that's what your readers want. Yeah, yeah. You, you you nailed it with that word seamless. You know, that's exactly what we're trying to do, and that is the difference, really, in what we're doing. Is that that you know, there's plenty of examples of people who have continued long running series after the authors have died, and some of them have done a fantastic job, mm -hmm. but there's always been a break, and it's the person who picks up the reins has always been chosen by, you know, the estate or, you know, somebody else, not the mm -hmm. author themselves. Yeah. They're bad. Yeah. So what we're doing is different is that, you know, this was actually Lee's choice. This is what he wanted. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, he, he, he has this expression, you know, he says that, you know, in every author, there's that little 10% or whatever the percentage is a little, there's a little bit of crazy in there. You know, you have to have that little bit of craziness. And the thing is that, you know, you can learn the craft, you can learn the techniques, all of that stuff, but that extra little margin of crazy, that has to come from within you. And we yeah. have the same DNA, we, we have the same crazy. And that, and that is the difference, you know? And so, you know, to sort of emphasize that, you know, that's why we are doing the first few books together so that people will be reassured that it's not just a sort of falling off the edge of a cliff and then, you know, popping up somewhere else. You know, it's it's more like a relay race where one person hands the baton to another and there's that that period of time where that both of them have their hands on it. And also why, you know, I, I just you know, I agreed to write with a with with a pseudonym because um, we wanted to really stress that family connection, the fact that we are brothers and it's not some random connection, it's yes. not just some commercial arrangement, it's one brother passing on to another to continue mm -hmm. in exactly the same vein as they were doing before. When when y'all's internet went out for a second, I was saying, I can't imagine doing it with my sister, but when you describe it that way, mm -hmm. it's, it's more, um, it does, probably makes it more seamless because you know each other so well and you're both writing and you're both mm -hmm. in there together. So yeah. it's fascinating. But Tasha, I want to talk to you for a second. More than a second. Speaking of writing a successful series, you have written the very popular, we talked about it a second ago, Lady Emily Mysteries. A series. When did your first one come out? When was the first Lady Emily? 2005. Okay. Wow, okay. Okay. So you were writing them when we met. A series that currently stands at 15 books. It's a meticulously researched series of historical suspense set in Victorian London and then later in other places around the world. But during that same time period, and Tasha, it's really like unlike anything else out there. Can you talk to us about what makes this time period so perfect as both a setting for mysteries and a sort of proving ground for ahead of her time protagonist? 
And while you're talking about that, also the challenges, because that's really far in the past. Like there's, you know, net, what, 1908, 19, early 1900s most of the time? Yeah. Yeah, okay, well, we're there us. now. At the, big, the first book was set in 1890. Okay. And I, I picked that year because that late Victorian era is, is to me endlessly fascinating. You've got all of this social change happening. You know, you've got people coming up with radical ideas that like five-year-olds shouldn't be working for 20 hours a day, things like that. <laughs> yep. um, and, and, you know, outrageous women thinking they should have the right to vote. Uh, but so it's this period Crazy where- Crazy women. Crazy women. Okay, but you know, I have a story for you about this, actually. I'm gonna get off track, but I'm gonna brief, I'm gonna try to be brief. I'll try to not write a novel about it. Um, I had one book set in the early, I think it was 1894, five maybe, and that um, dealt with a lot of the suffrage issues. And at that time in real life, in Britain, there was this, this group of women called the Women's Liberal Federation, and they were considered the most radical women basically on the planet, okay? And they had a schism in that year because half of these incredibly radical women thought that it was going too far to suggest that women should actually vote. I mean, no, you know, let's not get crazy here, right? Let's like, not push we need the boundaries, right? yes. It's and so, so you know, the Victorian era is full of so many amazing historical figures who seem to spring from the womb as iconoclasts, you know, fighting for women's rights, fighting for children's rights, uh, fighting for social change. But the thing that always fascinated me about it is, is that you can have all those people, but until you get a ground swell of support from the non-iconoclasts, like the people who are already comfortable, who are doing fine, until those people start to turn around and say, hey, wait a minute, you know what? The way things are isn't okay. Like we need to take yeah. a look at these things. Until you get that ground swell, you can't get wholesale social change. And so I wanted, when I was starting writing the series, I wanted to think about what would it take and what would catalyze a young woman who is comfortable, who has everything she wants? What makes her go from being comfortable in her coddled upper class life to saying, a lot of these things aren't okay that we take for granted. And so I, I, that was kind of why I picked the time period and okay. also, you know, that late Victorian era, you've got you know, the British Empire, the sun never sets, right? The sun never set on the British Empire. At that time, there was never a, a moment on planet Earth where the sun wasn't shining on some part of the empire. And Amazing. we today can look back at this and say, not only that we know the empire isn't in fact going to last forever, but also that it's gonna come up against the hard stop of World War I. We know this, they didn't. They truly believed that this was gonna go on and on and on. And so I, I find something really poignant about that, that time that, you know, that the way we can look at it nostalgically and say, wow, we actually know what's coming. And there were some interesting legal aspects to that period too, in terms of the woman mm. on that. Well, absolutely, because you you go from during that late Victorian era where women can't own property separately from their husbands. You get married, everything goes to your husband. But then there comes a point with the Women's Property Act where women, I mean, the craziness that women can mm -hmm. own things separately from their husbands. So this is a really interesting. It's a really interesting time period. Well, and what's interesting is you didn't make her marginalized mm -hmm. so that she had to butt the system. You made her comfortable, but still have mm -hmm. enough, you know, mm -hmm. guts to do and then keep doing it through yeah. 15 books. So it's great. Yeah, it's because I, you know, I think it's really interesting to write about and think about the marginalized people. But 
I was really taken with this notion that you need those people. You need those people who are comfortable yep. to start getting things going if you want actual change to happen. That's yeah. so interesting. That's a really good point. And wow, it just shows that everything is continuously relevant, right? I mean, everything that we're, 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 we're living the same things over and over again. Um, well, so of well, course, I think so. oh, yeah, sorry. Oh, ahead. no, I was just going to say that I think that's one of the things about historical fiction that I have always loved is yeah. that, you know, if you start getting, if you're writing fiction and you start getting didactic and people feel like you're judging them, mm -hmm. yeah. that's not really a good way to reach people and make mm -hmm. them think about it. But when you have the lens of history, everything is at arm's length. And so we're not saying that everyone now is doing this, but hey, this is what they were all doing in the last Gilded Age. And of yeah. course we can all draw the conclusion, but it doesn't feel as accusatory. So yeah. I think there's a way that you can kind of, people are more open to hearing it when they think it's not about yeah. them. Yeah. They don't get as defensive. Yep, yes, that's yeah. a good point. Yeah. Well, of course, we know the two of you are married, um, but we would love to know your story. So can you tell us a little bit how you met and what it's like to be married to another successful author? Well, you know, the, the way this happened really was that I was at, well, we were both at a writer's at a book conference and I picked him up in the bar. And anyone who's <laughs> ever been to a writer's conference knows that everything that is happening in the evening is happening in the bar. And uh, yeah, I picked him up in the bar. I picked him up in the bar. Well, there's a little bit more to it than she lets on be. Um, I like her. I mean, the, yeah, no, the story is, you know, it is factually true, but um, a little bit of background was it was the year before my first book came out. And oh, so no. I've been to, I've been told, okay, you've got to start going to these industry events, go to these conferences, meet, you know, readers and reviewers and booksellers and everybody who's involved, start to try to get your name known a little bit. So um, I go to this, you know, where I go to this conference actually with my brother and we had had dinner. We'd had a massive steak dinner and we, we came in the, hotel, in the conference hotel and we came out and he wanted to go outside for a cigarette. And, you know, I, apart from him, I knew no one. I knew nobody. And really, all I wanted to do was just go outside with him when he had his cigarette. But I thought, no, that's stupid. I've, I've come here to work. I've got to start meeting people. So I better get on with it. And, and he actually, Lee calls this the camel that changed the world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Yeah. So I... I, I, I I say I tell him that I'll see him later, and I, I go and I figure I, I walk to the to the entrance to the bar, and in this particular hotel, the bar was enormous, and it had a you know the actual bar down one side where you get your drinks, round tables all along the middle, and then booths at the other side, and it was crammed full of people. And I thought, oh god, I don't know anybody. What am I going to do? Because you know, in England, you just don't go up to people and say hi. Let me tell you about me. Well, you're you supposed know. to be properly. Produced, exactly, right? You're you supposed know. to be properly introduced. Where was so the conference? Wait, back up. Where was the Baltimore. conference? Baltimore. Baltimore. 2008. October 8th, 2008. Mm -hmm. oh, so just wow. over Yeah, so, so I think what I'll do is I'll go to the far end of the bar, right? I'll push my way through the crowd to the very far end. Then I'll turn around and start making my way back. And then even if I lose my nerve, I'll at least have to say, you know, excuse me or I'm sorry or something. You know, I have to at least converse with people. I love this. This is great. So this, is my, this is my plan. So I take one step into the room, and then I see Tasha standing at one of these round tables in the middle with a group of friends. And I, I see her standing there, and I think, right, the plan has changed. <laughs> but... <laughs> But the problem is, what am I going to do? I can't just go up to this gorgeous girl, you know. So I think, well, what I'll do, I'm in a bar and I haven't got a drink. So I'll go and order a drink. And while I'm waiting for it to come, I'll think of something. So, you know, most bars in my life that I've been to, you know, you wait. it seems like you wait half an hour for your drink to come, right? So I think there'll be plenty of time. But no, this particular bar, uh, you know, I order the drink and a moment later it's there in my hand. And I'm like, oh, no, I haven't thought of anything yet. Well, this, isn't, this is terrible. <laughs> And then I look around, 
and she is walking over towards me. And so, yeah, we... we yeah, and his different on this is that I saw that he was on his own and didn't know anyone. Mm. So and I was new. And that he was you new. You were rescuing yes. him. Right, because that's what we single girls in bars do. <laughs> we just look out for men who look a little lonely and we try to make them feel better, right? I mean, please. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> but but it was so fun because we just started talking and that was it i mean like we we haven't stopped talking since then and i guess oh, we've been chatting for awesome. about an hour and his brother came in and you know i had known him for for three years his brother uh more than three years and he came up and he he gave me a hug and he said so i see you've met my brother and I was like, what is he talking about? And then I looked at it. I, oh, I was like, wow. But you know, that it was great because awesome. Lee is such a generous, kind guy, right? And everybody is always trying to get a piece of him. And, and you know, I, I considered him a friend. And quite honestly, if I had known Andrew, like if he had been with Andrew, I wouldn't have gone and picked up in the bar because I wouldn't have wanted to like, <laughs> interfere with them having a drink so it, it just it really was the camel that That's changed the world. oh i love that so on the note of that most adorable in the world meet cute scenario which i no love kidding. <laughs> it's so great. and i love that it was a writer's conference it I wasn't know, like i know rando but, bar you yeah. know i i feel like we should go from this romantic meet cute into the home records is this now a great time to reveal this new cover i want to yes! see this all about it mary kay can you tell us about your fabulous new book well it does there i don't know if it'll i'm still working on it by the way be <laughs> cute in the home records but here is here's the elevator pitch hattie cavanaugh is a down on her luck contractor whose latest house flipped has flopped and she's in a Savannah coffee shop when a reality television producer deliberately eavesdrops on her conversation and he needs a, he sorely needs a hit of his own. So Mo Lopez, that's his name, Mauricio Lopez casts her in a show called the home records for an HGTV type network. And he pairs her with a hunky L.A. interior designer. Their mission is to restore a dilapidated Tybee Island beach house. Um, and so it's kind of a cross. It's at the intersection of, uh, I don't know, flipper flop and the bachelor kind of my, my yeah. sold in <laughs> i am so here for this huh? i am I here know. For this. Huh. Huh. anyway um the so they're working on this old tidy beach house the workers find the wallet in the wall of a long missing local school teacher and then that's when hattie's project takes a turn she never expected and I think Sean is going to give us the long-awaited yes. look at the Home Wreckers cover. Yay. There it is. Oh, my oh, God, God. I love it so much. Oh, love it. Perfect. Love. Okay. So we are going to be talking about this. I know. Too I mean, long. I'm writing it. May 3rd, May 3rd. Oh, we're so excited. Okay. We're going to be talking more about the home records in the after show. We have a couple quick announcements and then Tasha and Andrew, we have one more question for you. So if you don't mind sticking around about another two minutes, if your internet can tolerate us, <laughs> we'll be back to you in two. Um, let me see. Let me find. All right. Patty, you want to so, take it away? Yes, I will. But if your internet can tolerate us, great. But if you can't tolerate us, we get it. It's been a night. We get it. We're um, alive. Yeah. So everyone out there, we want to remind you all to check out our Friends in Fiction Writer's Block podcast. We keep telling you about it, and it keeps getting better and better and better. Yeah. We will always post links under announcements each time a new podcast goes out. This week, Ron Block and I talked about poetry and novels and somehow we ended up on Jungian archetypes and it was all with the author of the blockbuster, Serena 
Ron Rash. And this week, Ron Block will talk to Sari Feldman about library rock stars, of which Ron Block is one. For sure. And if you have not joined our book club yet, what are you waiting for? Our friends Lisa Harrison and Brenda Gardner are the most amazing hosts, and the group is more than 9,000 strong. This would be a really good week to join because on Sunday, October 17th, they are going to be celebrating with Patty for the pre-pub day brunch at 1 p.m. Eastern, and you're going to get to hear about all things Once Upon a Wardrobe. We're so excited. If you have not pre-ordered your book, you guys, right now, the clock is ticking. you got to go do it. It's amazing. It will just break your heart. Can I do a sound effect? Am I allowed? Yes. 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 Okay. yes please. Tick. How was it? Was it good? It was, so it was good. good. Yeah. Might be redeeming yourself. Yeah. Go and ahead. then on Monday, October 25th, they're talking to Paige Crutcher about her new novel, The Orphan Witch, just out. And then I'll be back later in the month, too, to talk about Christmas in Peach Tree Bluff, which comes out also on October 26th. And it's just amazing how similar those plots were. <laughs> That was a joke, Andrew. You, yours, <laughs> yours also begins with a dead body in a morgue, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> of, a, of, of, a, of, a, of a character that you have been grooming for 25 or 30 books. For sure. Okay. <laughs> but next week, next week, we uh, got to talk about next week. Right here, 7 p.m., we're going to welcome Alice Hoffman and celebrate and her gorgeous new book. It's we're gorgeous. Gonna celebrate it is. So We're going to celebrate the launch of Patty's Once Upon a Wardrobe. Remember to pre-order it if you have not done so. And because those first week sales can really make or break a book. And we know that. So don't forget to. I'm going to borrow from MKA. Hashtag buy my book, damn it. <laughs> pre-order, damn it. Same yeah. with Andrew. Yes, pre-ordered, yes, damn absolutely. it. Absolutely. Then in two weeks, <laughs> join us and meet Richard Paul Evans as we celebrate Christie's new book, Christmas in Peachtree Bluff. Yay. Yay. And also, don't forget, um, we always have amazing Friends of Fiction merchandise available from our partners at Oxford Exchange. And most recently, we have an incredible Seasons Readings box that includes Mary Kay's The Santa Suit, Patty's Once Upon a Wardrobe and My Christmas in Peachtree Bluff with the option to add Kristen's The Forest of Vanishing Stars, which I know you've all read, but so this would just be if you're getting it for a gift for someone else. <laughs> um, but this is really the ultimate holiday gift. It comes with a free, adorable Seasons Readings um, ornament, and you can personalize your box anyway. You can add merch to it. You can add other books. You can add the sky is the limit. It's the ultimate holiday gift. So check it out. And you guys, you guys, you guys, we're going to Florida together. Woo! Woo! Tasha and Al Andrew, do you want to come? Ah, yes. yes. Want to go yes. on a field trip? Okay, we're going on a road trip. Yes. So we are going to Florida. If you want, you can fit in the convertible with us. If you Kristen's want to catch, oh, yeah. yes, yeah, I'm a very if, safe driver. Yeah. If you want to, would you, if you, you've got to look forward when you drive, Kristen, like. Forward. So <laughs> I to Paris on a whim with a stranger. I'm not getting in the car with her. <laughs> I know. No kidding. So if you want to catch all four of us, plus Meg, check out our Friends in Fiction newsletter. It has all of our book tours. We're all over the place, but then we're all together in Florida. We'll be in St. Pete and Tampa and Punta Gorda and Sanibel. So see us on our individual tours and then come see us in Florida. And just a very quick reminder, you guys all know that last week Facebook went down for a little while, which kind of freaked us all out. I know a lot of you watch us on Facebook. Just make sure you sign up for our YouTube um, channel. I Subscribe us on, on YouTube. Subscribe to our newsletter. And then that way, if that kind of thing ever happens again, you always know we can reach you and you'll know where to find us. So it's just a good backup plan. And, you know, we send out fun content in our newsletter. All 90, almost all 90 plus of our previous episodes are on YouTube. Um, just great additional places to find us. So make sure you do that now. You can do that on our website or at the link that Sean put below. That was a lot of announcements. Tasha and Andrew. Was. Was very, Sorry. Very nice. Sorry, we had a lot to say tonight. We have a lot going on. Yes. Yeah. Very busy. But <laughs> we have never important we... fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, we have talked about a little bit of your history tonight, and we've loved getting to know you a little bit better. So can you tell us, um, what were the values around reading and writing in your childhood? Tasha, do you want to start us off? I mean, I, for me, reading, uh, and I'm not exaggerating this, my first memory is of my mother, I was sitting with my mom in our living room on, on a couch and she was reading Little House in the Big Woods by Laura Ingalls oh, Wilder. Oh, I love that. Right? And I realized that I was ahead of her on the page. And oh, wow. that would so gives me goosebumps thinking about it because that was the minute that I learned that you didn't need a grown up. Oh, I love that. And that was just, that was everything. That was everything. That was just me done. And my entire childhood, you know, we would go to the library. I could get as many books as I wanted. It was just heaven. And and as a child, mm -hmm. if I was kind of at loose ends and didn't know what to do, my dad would take me into the room where our bookcases were, and we would do what I, as a little girl, would say, "Can we look at the books?" And we would just go through, he would walk with me and we'd look at the books and he'd pull things down and say, oh, this is a book about this and you might be interested, you know. So to me, I mean, reading is everything. Reading gives you the entire world. It, it, yeah. it can take you to any time, any place. And there's been nothing in my life that has been more important and significant to me than reading. That's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. What about you, Andrew? Yeah, I mean, um, I remember my first memory with books really would, was when I was when I was very small. You know, I was born in Birmingham, England, and um, there was a small public library not too far from the house, and we would go there. It was almost like a pilgrimage once a week. And I mean, when I was little, uh, my mother was was always infuriated with me because I always wanted to get the same books. You know, if I if there were some that I really liked, and I always just wanted to get them over and over. Um, I think I would. You know, I wanted a sure thing, you know. Small pig. Yeah, small pig was, was my very favorite oh, by Arnold Lerbel. Yeah, that was, that was my, Tasha bought me a, a first edition of it. It's oh. wonderful. Oh, that was sweet. Yeah, so, you know, reading was always a really big thing. And the, the time that it really got sort of, you know, really took pride of place in my life was one year when I was at, when I was at school. This was sort of England in the early 1970s. And... Um, the school I went to, the teachers had this idea that you shouldn't mark any work because if, um, it, you know, they, they felt that marking work was an elitist thing because if somebody hadn't done very well, then they might feel bad and that, you know, that should be avoided. So therefore, no work was going to get marked. And so I fell into lots of trouble with this. You know, I'm, I'm probably the world's worst person when it comes to, ge to geography. And so one, one day, for example, I remember my mother knew that I had a geography test and she asked me how I'd done. So I said, well, I don't know. So she assumed that this was just some way of avoiding telling her that I'd done incredibly badly. So she <laughs> said, well, you know, there must have been, you know, there must have been a number at the bottom, you know, something out of 20 or whatever. I said, no, there was nothing. So she went to the school and she demanded from the head teacher to know what was going on. And they said, yeah, no, we don't, we don't mark work here. You know, if you want to mark the work, then, you know, you can. So she said, no, I'm not doing your work for you. Um, so no work got marked. And then, you know, I was an ornery little kid and, you know, probably still am really deep inside. And I, I thought, well, you know what? If the teachers aren't going to mark the work, I'm not going to do the work. So instead, I just took books to school. And every, every day I, I just sat and I just, you know, I had a book under my desk and I just read. And in fact, if, the, if there's time for this story, I'm, you know, it was really it probably put me on the path that I'm on today because... Most of the time I, I had, you know, there's this kind of sixth sense that would pick up if the teacher kind of came out from behind his desk and came and tried, you know, to see what everybody was doing. And so normally I didn't get caught. But once I was, I think I was 10, I was reading Watership Down. Remember that book? Oh, you know, yeah. With the oh yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, a great one. Love that book. And I was totally engrossed in it and I didn't hear him coming and he caught me reading it. So he kind of snatches the book and he's, he, first of all, he goes on this big tirade about how it's a baby's book and I shouldn't have been reading it. And then he looks at me and he says, so I suppose you think you're a good reader, do you? Well, you're not. You are not a good reader unless you can oh, pick any no. book off any bookshelf and read it without thinking. 
So first of all, I'm like, read without thinking? What, what's that all about? What is that? What? But then, of course, it sounded like a challenge, right? So I'm like, yeah. We've but, already uh, learned about the circle. challenge situation. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so I think the minute I get home tonight, I'm going to my dad's bookcase and I'm picking any book off it and I'm going to read it. But, you know, as the day goes on, I was getting a little nervous. I was thinking, well, what if he's right? What if I aren't? I'm not a very good reader. What if I can't read one of these books? So I go home, reach out at random, pull down a book, and it is Ice Station Zebra by Alistair MacLean. Oh, no. And I had no idea what it was, you know, and I'm like, wait, they, they have stations on the ice and there are zebras there? I'm like, what? You know, I had no idea what it was. So I start reading it, and um, it just pulled me in, and, and it, it really did change my life because – First time I'd ever come across an unreliable narrator, you know. The idea, I don't know if, if you've read this book, but, you know, it starts out with this guy who has to blag his way onto an American nuclear submarine that is in dock in Scotland. As you do. As you do. And so immediately I'm, 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 pulled, I'm hooked. And, you know, he, he weaves this incredible tale, which, you know, the captain is somewhat, somewhat dubious, but eventually is convinced and lets him on. And I'm, you know, I'm totally taken in by it. I believe every word of it. Um, and at the end of that first chapter, the, the narrator says something like, you know, yeah, I was, I was kind of glad that he believed it because, you know, I only just made it up on the spot. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> it blew my mind. It wasn't true. He was lying. You know, I had no idea that you could lie in books. You know, I had not, you know. And so... <laughs> I, I tore through the rest of that book, I, you know, and, and you know, to, again, Tasha has brought me, it's, it's over there um, on, on one of the bookshelves, the uh, first uh, first edition hardcover of that book, because it, it totally changed me. And from that day onwards, I was just completely addicted to anything to do with action, adventure, spy thrillers. I love spy thrillers. All of those kind of books, I just couldn't, I couldn't get enough of them. And it really all came, you know, if that teacher had actually marked the work that we'd done. You, know, <laughs> probably you would have would... never picked up that book. Right. Oh, exactly. You'd be better at geography, but who, who needs to know about direction? <laughs> oh, my yeah. goodness. Oh, you two have been such so amazing many guests. Oh, my, gosh. Oh my gosh. I know. Yes. With so many chances. I know. You need to come back. That's all there oh is. Oh, my God. Oh, oh, so we would love to. Andrew, you guys were we so delightful. Oh, I, completely. So we are all coming to your house, regardless of hurricanes. Yeah. That's going to be so fun. Yeah, we just <laughs> decided. Next, next yeah. Friends and Fiction live from your house. We'll, we'll be there. But yeah. um, you two, thank you so much for joining us tonight. This was such a thank pleasure you. getting to know you a little bit. We're so excited for your new books. Um, and we're just so grateful that you spent a little bit of time and opened up and yeah. told us your stories. And um, it was just great. So thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank well, you. thank you for having us. Yeah, it's been an you. absolute pleasure. Good to see you guys. Yeah, for yeah. sure. For my, sure. Yeah. my only question is, are you coming here before we come to Florida or is that after? <laughs> oh, well, after. You know, it's probably after. after. If, you guys just, if, if you guys hop mm -hmm. in the convertible in Florida, I'll just drive us up to Wyoming after we're we've done our a, Florida date. We're going to need a bigger vehicle. <laughs> we're going to need you a bus what? with a wrap on it. A wrap you know what? We, we have a convertible. We could bring our own. Mm -hmm. That's perfect. That's amazing. Okay, so you guys perfect. just let the publishers know your change of tour plans, and we'll see you in Florida. <laughs> we'll see you there. <laughs> Thank Bye, you guys. so much. Have a wonderful Bye, night. Thank, Thank you. you. And to all of you out there, stick around for the after show. That was such a wonderful show. We're going to be talking a little bit more about the home wreckers. Um, we're going to be talking about Patty's upcoming book, Christy's upcoming book. And um, I have a remember book wreck that you're not going to want to miss. Uh, yes, exactly. That's right. And we are ex so excited for a whole new season of books. Be sure to come back next week, same time, same place, as we welcome Alice Hoffman and celebrate the launch of Patty's Once Upon a Wardrobe. So see you in just a few seconds in the after show. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you for tuning in. You can join us every week on Facebook or YouTube where our live show airs on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Also, subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Instagram. We're so glad you're here. Wow. <laughs> they were so great. Yeah, they were great. <laughs>
Yeah. We could have talked to them for two hours. And I, I, I wanted to say it, but I knew we, we could have kept talking and talking and talking. He said he was from Birmingham. He said it with that beautiful accent, yeah. Birmingham, England. And I live in Birmingham, Alabama. Oh, that's I was right. Like, I, mean, I was like, oh, we're, we're, we're sister cities. Sister yet, cities, that's right. Yeah, you're like Beaufort and Beaufort. <laughs> yeah. 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 And like, I'm from Salisbury, North Carolina, and Salisbury, England is our sister city. Yeah. My sister city. So I live in the my... States, and there's an app, Avondale, uh, Shakespearean place. So there you go. There you go. Oh. Well, that was so great. But, you know, I feel like we get to see the cover of the home records, but I feel like we didn't get to dig into that wallet story, which I would love to hear about. Mm -hmm. So, Mary Kay, well, was there a connection between that wallet and yeah. something that happened in your life? Last winter, when we were remodeling the, another beat up old house on Tybee Island, our contractors were tearing out the back wall of the existing bathroom because we had termites and rot and stuff. And in between the joists, they found an old wallet, which they gave to me. And when I looked at it, I saw it had been in there, obviously, since 1954, the uh, previous owned the woman's name, everything was in there, her driver's license, social security card, military ID. And I posted it on social media, I, I knew I, I looked and saw that she'd passed away the owner. And I said, I don't know where her, I saw who her survivors were, but I couldn't find them. So I posted their names. By morning, people said, oh, here's where they are. And we connected with them. And um, it turns out this woman and her husband uh, had lived there when they were newlyweds. He was in the Navy and they lived, it was a duplex at that time. And they lived in a little downstairs apartment and he was in the Navy and gone. And she was home with a little baby and, um, somehow the wallet got in the wall and still when we when i talked to her children uh they had no answers for how the wallet got in the wall so Crazy. i started i know i started and actually it was so weird it's the most response i've ever had to anything that i posted on social media which is a little scary because i mean you could be anyone <laughs> <laughs> but people just were so fascinated with it um and I thought, well, and I already knew that I was working on a book that was um, set on Tybee with a woman fixing up an old house. And I thought, okay, well, this is a universe telling me yep. that this story needs to be part of the plot of the book, which I had not planned on. So actually, it's in there. That's I mean, amazing. It's, it's so weird. I know we joked about it a little bit beforehand, but how... Um, we write about things and they happen, right? Oh, wow. yes. Or or we take these little breadcrumbs in our life and they show up in a book. And sometimes we mean for them to, and sometimes they just happen. So. And sometimes the breadcrumbs lead us into an old wardrobe. Oh, yes. Nice. Excellent segue. Oh, did you, you see what writer? I did there? That was that good. Was good. It even like it even like went yeah. like this for a second. I mean, like that was so good. That's what you've been up for like 108 hours, Patty. I was going to say I haven't, <laughs> I haven't slept in a week. So, um, but yeah, I mean, in Once Upon a Wardrobe, yes, the wardrobe. It, it's the same thing, Mary Kay. That that a little bit of the book is about is this yeah. idea that there's parts of an author's life that shows up in novels, like listening to Tasha and Andrew talk, you can yeah. see those little moments, but, uh, and the wallet. And we want to explain where a story comes from, but in the end, in the real end, we can't because yeah. it's ineffable and it's mysterious. But yes, Once Upon a Wardrobe is a bit about these little breadcrumbs in the author's life that show up in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. You know what I was just thinking about that as you were talking is that so much of Friends in Fiction is about explaining the story behind the story. And yeah. it is as if 
you went to C.S. Lewis and invited him on Friends and Fiction. Oh, so that we can hilarious. talk about this. So thank you for making C.S. Lewis a Friends and Fiction guest in your oh, book. That's what amazing. What a missed opportunity. I mean, Kristen's already got that beard. Like she could have dressed up as him. Oh my gosh. We, we, we well, the launch that. is next week. She can we go We haven't really full. missed the opportunity yet. Yeah. What are we going to do? What are we going to do for props? I mean, we haven't even discussed that. I know. I think that Kristen should have a pipe. And yes. Embiid Lewis. And then you can, Good. nobody wants to be the white witch. Like, no. Oh, wants. I do. Mm -hmm. I was thinking I could maybe get a lion <laughs> totally. or something. Yeah, somebody could be a lion. Um, I want to be the white witch. Okay. I'll get you a crown by next. I will get you a crown by next Wednesday. Well, I will you know, get you a crown by next. You Wednesday. know what I love is we've been talking. You and I, Patty, have been working together on this script for next week, right? Yep. Like on kind of the things um, we're going to be talking about. And because Alice Hoffman's going to be there too, it's just going to be this night about magic. We're going to talk it's about, about magic. magic and the magic of story and the magic of books exactly. to bring us together and to open right. up these new worlds to us and again, an enchantment like this enchantment. idea that you enter these lands whether yeah. it's her book of magic or through a wardrobe or even yeah. in a story without magic per yeah. se it is magic it so is what, i think we have to think about yeah. the portal what's the portal for Here's next portal. week yeah the world well i think the portal is pre-ordering um, the yeah, it's a pre-order portal. portal. Yes. It's a pre-order portal. So also, that when we talk mm -hmm. about it on Wednesday, you will have already you know. walked through it. You already know. You'll all be in. I Otherwise, agree. you'll feel so left out if you don't mm -hmm. have don't, it in your hands. I know. I don't want you to feel left out. We don't want you, guys, you to be sad. Um, Jason, this just occurred to me. Jason, my husband, just built a wardrobe for our bedroom today. I, okay, like that's unprompted. Weird. So I feel like next week I should do Friends and Fiction like live sitting in our wardrobe, like amongst all my hanging dresses. I think dresses. it's a good idea. Oh. Do, you have mean, wifi? Weird, but... do you have Wi Fi in that wardrobe? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> okay, that's a, that's I, a bad I'm, idea. I'm going to be with you. I was going to say the three of us are going to oh, be yes. together. So when you guys will be together, I'll be in a closet. So it all works I'm there. Be, I'm going to just have a handful of Turkish delight and I'm going to just, I'm just going to see what happens. <laughs> Do right. not. Okay. Enough about me. We, no, and they, and okay, okay, then so, it's Christie's. So it, it is Christie's and I am, I'm like the latest reader ever. I'm reading Christie's book right now. It is absolutely phenomenal. I'm You're not, not that late. It hasn't come out yet. <laughs> well, I know, but I've had it for a little while, right? But there's a scene that I stumbled across the other day. I'm not going to spoil it right now, but like it, I haven't even finished the book and like it made the book for me. Um, and I will, I will reveal that on your launch episode, like the scene that I'm like, yes, Christy, you've achieved everything there is to achieve in the literary universe with this one scene. Yeah. <laughs> but can I, can I also just say though, to all of you out there, I, you know, I know we say this sometimes, but for those of you who tune in and see, I can say it cause I don't have a new book coming out, but no. you, you guys, <laughs> Okay, these ladies here put so much into this. We're all losing our minds. Like there's smoke coming out of our ears because the gears are turning too fast. Like there's just, we, we're doing so much. And, I, you know, I know it's a big thing to say, go out and think about buying our book. But if you're going to think about buying it eventually, it, it helps us so much if you consider pre-ordering it or buying it in the first couple of days, because it means so much for the trajectory of a book. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you're not a person who buys books, if you prefer to get them from the library, that's fine too. Put them on your library waiting list. You know, let the library know you're interested. But if you are someone who's eventually going to buy it, think about if you can buy it now or buy it for a gift or, and I'm not trying to give you the hard sell. I, I just oh, know. I know. Oh, I like it. I like I, I, I like the hard no, sell. I, Buy my I book, just, damn it. I, I yeah. just, you know, it, it only works when Kathy says it. Well, but I, I know. I also, it doesn't sound right I, when I, I know. Say it. I just I know. But you know, we we don't make any money from this show. We put money into this show. Like Christy tells us all the time, you have to write another check. I know. <laughs> I'm the finance director, and I hate it, y'all. I'm like. You guys, we all have to put in this much, this much, this much. So, so what, what I'm all all out there. 
feed. <laughs> what, <laughs> what, deposit us in the bank of love. That's what, what you all do for and, us. What, and that is worth it. If you do not spend a dime on us, it is still worth it. But like, we, it, this is a labor of love for us. So I, I guess I'm just saying, I don't want you to think that we're getting rich on this show because we're not. Wait, wait, wait. Um, Patty, Patty's Patty has to go. go. No, Chris I have to go. go because if you're still hanging around your computer, yeah, yeah, yeah. I am about to be on Facebook Live with Rachel McMillan and she is in Canada and she's giving away a Canadian version, but we her. are going to go over and do a pre-pub chat on Rachel McMillan's Facebook page. And I love y'all madly. And that was an love extraordinary you. night. I get to see you on Tuesday. Yeah, I know. Oh, I get to see y'all. And nice. I get to see you, Kathy, on Monday and you on Tuesday. And then you, you Kristen, Saturday. the following week. Yeah. And Meg, will, Meg, Meg will be riding shoddy. Meg's always then riding shoddy. And we get to see Kristen in just a few more days. Yeah, it's going to be great. I, I, I love you guys 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 between now and then. I promise. Bye. Do it. Bye, All right. Say, say hi to Rachel for us. Love you guys. Bye.